hear me, everyone? Please come in, take a seat. There are plenty of seats in the middle of the auditorium. My name is Deirdre Delbert. I am professor of English here at Bard College, and I'm also dean of the college. And it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome you all to the Hannah Arendt Center's 12th annual conference. This year's theme is racism and anti-Semitism. For those who have long attended the conference, allow me to welcome you back. And newcomers, we anticipate sharing with you a wide range of talks and panels that will certainly stimulate, debate, and unsettle received ideas. In particular, I wish to welcome undergraduates uh, from Annandale and from our Bard High School Early Colleges. I see our front two rows here are all students. Are you, are you from Queens? Manhattan, welcome. We're very happy to have you here. <laughs> um, we welcome all who join us today and tomorrow in our collective work of inquiry and discussion. Students, you in particular, as participants and interlocutors in everything that goes forward from now. Bard College has long embraced a proud history of welcoming refugees and dissidents, theorists and practitioners, artists, scientists, scholars to this campus, even as it refuses to rest easily upon assumptions about the work we are called to do as educators and as citizens of this nation and indeed of a wider world. This year's conference challenges us, as its organizers boldly propose, to focus on particularly difficult questions in and about the work of Hannah Arendt, specifically in the context of our contemporary political moment, which is marked repeatedly and regularly by anti-Semitic and racist violence. Not somewhere else, but here and now. The conference will consider the following questions. What is racism? Is anti-Semitism a form of racism? What does anti-racism mean today? Is it anti-Semitic to criticize the state of Israel? Is equality possible in a world where prejudice exists? And how can we respond to racist fantasies? Now, clearly these are questions with no clear or simple answers. We will encounter a range of voices and convictions over the next two days. And make no mistake about it, the presence in everyday life of racism and of anti-Semitism is real in our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our families, our churches, our mosques, our synagogues, our schools, our universities. We live in a time of open as well as veiled expressions of racism and anti-Semitism, from hate crimes that make the front page of the New York Times to casual and unreflecting daily usages in speech and interaction among and within groups that define themselves or are defined in relation to these ideas. Bard College does not stand apart from these realities, nor do any of, us, any of us as individuals or members of any particular group stand apart. In moments of crisis, we strain at the bounds of civil discourse, even as we affirm the urgency of critical engagement. We live in a time when demands for accountability, both of others and of ourselves, take on increasing power. Let us not only listen to, but also hear these voices, questions, and perspectives of diverse others in what unfolds at this conference. So too, let us allow for and really hear the voices of difference that arise from within ourselves. The pledge we make as an institution of higher learning 
is to uphold the free and frank exchange of ideas, recognizing painful divisions within communities and within ourselves that often militate against realizing such exchanges. Critical inquiry demands that we confront the possibility of error and anticipate failures of understanding in ourselves and others, even as we are open to the radical possibility of new ways of knowing, to vulnerability, and to change. Defending the integrity of this space speaks to our calling both as educators and lifelong students, even as it demands that we attend to the ethical commitments and felt experiences of every participant in these dialogues. Bard College upholds with its free speech policy the open exchange of ideas, even as it prohibits conduct that employs force or threat of force. We call upon all participants at this conference and in our communities to honor these values, which we hold as foundational to our mission. I will close with a passage from Audre Lorde in the work of one of this conference's speakers. I've been reading his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, which will be discussed this month by faculty, staff, and students in reading groups in Annandale, responding to questions that have arisen here and elsewhere about the corrosive and persistent presence of racism in our communities. Ibram Kandi quotes Audre Lorde, we have all been programmed to respond to the human differences between us with fear and loathing and to handle that difference in one of three ways. Ignore it, and if that is not possible, copy it if we think it is dominant, or destroy it if we think it is subordinate. But we have no patterns for relating across our human differences as equals. Confronting Aaron's legacy in terms of human differences between us will absorb all our energy, attention, good faith, and principled engagement over the next two days. I look forward to this difficult and necessary work for all of us. And now please join me in welcoming to the stage the conference organizer, Roger Berkowitz, who is the founder and academic director of the Hannah Arendt Center, professor of political studies, philosophy, and human rights at Bard College. Once again, welcome to Bard. Much, Deirdre. Yesterday was yesterday. Is this still on or I think we're on? Yesterday was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the year for Jews. A gunman in Germany tried to storm a synagogue in which Jews were praying. Foiled by security, he opened fire and killed two people as did the gunman who opened fire in two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. The German gunman live-streamed his attack. He identified himself as an Anan, denied the Holocaust, denounced feminists and immigrants, and then declared the root of all these problems is Jews. The shooting of Jews in Germany on Yom Kippur barely registered, and no wonder. Hateful attacks on Jews, Muslims, blacks, gays, trans people, refugees, and other minorities are rising. The list of unarmed black men and women killed by police continues to grow, including Michael Brown, Dontre Hamilton, Eric Garner, John Crawford, Isel Ford, Dante Parker, Tanisha Anderson, Tamir Rice, and many others. And now Botham Jean, who was killed in his own apartment by an allegedly confused off-duty police officer in Dallas. 22 people were killed and 24 injured in a mass shooting in El Paso, targeting Mexicans and the Hispanic invasion of Texas. One woman and three others injured. One woman was killed and three others injured 
in a shooting inside the Chabad Synagogue in Poway, California by a gunman who blamed Jews for the supposed white genocide conspiracy theory. 51 people were killed and 49 injured in attacks on the Al Noor Mosque and Linwood Islamic Center in New Zealand. The gunman, as I said, live streamed his attack on Facebook and in a 74 page manifesto titled The Great Replacement, referenced the Great Replacement and white genocide conspiracy theories. Two people died and five were wounded in an attack on a yoga institute in Tallahassee, Florida by a gunman who openly expressed his hatred of women and wrote about rape, torture, and murder in his journals. Eleven people were killed and seven injured inside the Tree of Life Synagogue in Squirrel Hill, Pittsburgh during Shabbat services. The gunman blamed Central American migrant caravans and immigrants. He blamed the Jewish nonprofit organization that provides humanitarian aid and assistance to refugees that he says brings invaders to kill our people. He says, I'm going in, and he later told police, all these Jews need to die. Six worshipers were killed and 19 others injured in the Quebec mosque shooting by a gunman with white nationalist and anti-Muslim beliefs. 49 people killed at a Latino gay nightclub Pulse in Orlando in 2016. A counter-protester in 2017 killed at the Unite the Right protest in Charlottesville. Nine African-American parishioners murdered by a white supremacist, Dylan Roof, in the Charleston Church Massacre. Closer to home in New York City, just this week, the New York Police Department published a report showing the city recorded 323 hate crimes from January 1st through last Sunday, up 33% from last year. Anti-Semitic incidents are the most common hate crime, having increased 53% to 170. Hate crimes against black people rose 7% to 31 this year. Hate crimes by victims motivated by victim sexual orientation rose 8% to 42. And there were also 25 crimes motivated by animus against white people, a 92% increase from last year. This reality includes a string of racist, anti-Semitic, and homophobic incidents that have plagued Bard College and our sister school, Simons Rock, over the last few weeks. At Simons Rock, anti-Semitic and racist graffiti was found on campus, and an African-American female student experienced an attack. In separate incidents on Bard the campus this week, some people drove through campus shouting racial and homophobic slurs at our students. Thankfully, the people who did this were identified and apprehended. Also last week, a white nationalist was found on campus putting stickers for the Patriot Front on buildings. He was banned from campus, and he, we learned he was part of a nationwide campaign that targeted college campuses across the country. Understandably, students at Simons Rock and Bard are shaken. We all are now living through a boorish and polarized political climate. The messages of intolerance and prejudice by political leaders has given license to expressions of hostility and hate on social media and spread fear that reaches to undergraduate campuses like Bard. The RN Center Conference is one way to respond, only one way. One way to respond and to resist the atmosphere of fear. It is an effort to do so that we in the liberal arts do best to think deeply, meaningfully, and provocatively about the most important issues facing our world. Some students have come to see this conference primarily as a response to those events and raised questions about it. One of my students wrote me yesterday morning and said, many feel that the dialogues and conferences such as the one we are soon to be hosting are being held in dissonance with the actions the college is taking that while we are trying to promote dialogue on racism on our campus, these conversations are ones that arise every year in the wake of incidents and dissolve with ro no real tangible evidence of progress just as quickly as they arrive. Students are asking, how can we respond? In the face of rising intolerance and prejudice that demands unwavering fidelity to accepted political correctness, 
and in the face of intolerance and prejudice that starts at the very top of our country, we are asking, how can we respect the plurality of opinions while also respecting each other? I honestly have no full and final answers to these questions, no good answers. A conference is unlikely to answer the question of how to solve racism. But it will, I hope, spur helpful, difficult, and honest questions and offer a safe place to ask them. We at the Hannah Arendt Center began planning this conference over a year ago, racism and anti-Semitism. It did seem like a lot to cover in two days. I had concerns. However, when I talked to a few of the Hannah Arendt student fellows, Hannah Arendt Center student fellows, they were deeply enthusiastic, and I became convinced we had to do it. So in a few moments, I'm going to situate this conference within the ideas of Hannah Arendt and those of some of our speakers. But first, I want you to hear from three students, three of our student fellows at the Hannah Arendt Center, who I talk to a lot in planning this conference and have strong feelings about why it's important. So I'd like to invite up to the stage, they're gonna give a, a brief account of their thoughts about the conference. Mark Williams, Jr., uh, graduate of Bard in 17, Charlotte Albert, and Isabella Santana. Thank you, Roger. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Williams, Jr., and I'm the Director of Equity and Inclusion and a faculty member in health education at Bard High School, Early College, Manhattan. Can you hear me now? Wonderful. Sorry, it's tough being short, I'm sorry. Everyone can hear me? Oh, yeah, okay, for sure. Good morning. My name is Mark Williams, Jr., and I'm the Director of Equity and Inclusion and a faculty member in health education at Bard High School, Early College, Manhattan. I'm a former Bard Early College graduate myself, having graduated from Bard, Queens, as well as a Bard College alumnus. Essentially, I've been with this so-called empire since I was a 90-pound, 13-year-old boy. As I continue to grow in the figurative sense, I am always reminded of Bard's motto, a place to think, and the ways in which the institution provides opportunities for critical thinking. We can never forget how important it is to think, and we have to push back against the idea that thinking is a form of inaction. For many of us, thinking, or rather learning how to think, is our first form of liberation. As a young black man, I will be the first to tell you that I am just learning to think critically about race. It was only two years ago that a white man told me explicitly that he could not sit next to me on the train because I made him uncomfortable. I know almost nothing about anti-Semitism except for the fact that it wasn't until earlier this year that I realized how many anti-Semitic remarks my family members have made because they lacked a fundamental understanding of Jewish life and culture. Instead, they trafficked in conspiracy theories about Jewish wealth and power. My point here is this. Conferences like this one are important because many of us either have no framework or a very shaky one for thinking through these kinds of experiences. Some of us are looking to grow our knowledge base. Others are looking to refine some thoughts. I've been attending these conferences since I was 16 years old. And every time I leave, I am always reminded that the process of thinking, and by extension learning, is rarely a calm experience. More often, it is deeply uncomfortable, but wonderfully mind-blowing. As I look in the crowd, and I take note of my students who are here, and the other early college students from the Bard Network who will be coming tomorrow, I'm reminded that for many of them, this is their first conference, their first experiment with confronting these topics in this type of way. As individuals, 
who have been at this longer than they have, we owe it to them to make sure that they get the opportunity to learn, and most importantly, how to think. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? No. Good morning. Is that better? No. Hello? Good morning. No. Hello? Okay, good morning. Perfect. My name is Charlotte Albert. I am a second semester senior studying political studies. This year's conference on anti-Semitism and racism is overdue in not only our community, but in academia as a whole. The incidents that have occurred this past week at Bard Simons Rock and on our own campus here in Annandale must not be dealt with as isolated attacks, but as, an exam as examples of our political reality. This conference similarly can be easily conceived as timely or in relation to these violent acts of hate, but again, must be regarded as a conversation pertaining to a wider, more complicated, and more expansive understanding of systemic racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and the list goes on. While we focus on racism and anti-Semitism for the next two days, it is important to note that we are, not trying to, we are not attempting to equate the two. Rather, we are attempting to foster and mediate critical conversations that are preemptive for action. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Isabella Santana, and I'm in my final year here at Bard. Um, last week was a painful week for Bard students of color, particularly black students. The events that transpired on Simons Rock campus, along with the hateful speech, action, and microaggressions of racism that take place on our own campus are unacceptable and indicative of the ways in which the disease of racism permeates all institutions. Insofar as America was built on racism and continues to rely on it, this should be no surprise. It is important for Bard to take accountability for its inherently racist founding. I want to make it clear that this event does not absolve Bard as an institution from racism. Racism and anti-Semitism exist on this campus, and while the Hannah Rent Center is cognizant of this and has been working to address these issues on campus and in the larger world, those of us who have been with the center understand and recognize that there is still more work to be done. Hundreds of students gathered last week in a series of forums mourning their own safety, expressing grievances, and demanding action. It is imperative that institutions such as BARD begin to take more explicit anti-racist action and that this responsibility no longer falls upon students of color. As we engage in discourse with one another over the next few days, I ask us all to think critically about the steps we will personally take toward anti-racist actions. We must work every day to dismantle and unlearn racism. Action is essential but we must not abandon conversation. Discourse is not antithetical to action, rather it is integral to meaningful action, and meaningful action is crucial to living in a plural world. Lastly, I ask that we listen. Listening to one another, but particularly to voices that are often unheard or silenced, is the point at which we must begin. There's a reason it's a pleasure to teach here. There's a reason it's a pleasure to teach here. Thank you, uh, Mark, Charlotte, and Isabella. Um, I think it's really important that we all as teachers realize that we learn as much from our students as we teach them. And uh, it's been a pleasure learning from the three of them and many others. The inspiration for this conference was Hannah Arendt's work on racism and anti-Semitism. You know, most people, or at least I did when I started reading Hannah Arendt, had a common sense idea that um, anti-Semitism was something about the hatred of Jews. Uh, people don't like Jews, so they're anti-Semites. The key insight, however, in Hannah Arendt's 
unorthodox approach to thinking about anti-Semitism is that she argues that anti-Semitism and Jew hatred are not the same thing. And she similarly will argue later that racism and hatred of blacks are not the same things. So what does she mean by this? Jew hatred, she says, is something that's not that hard to understand. It is the intense dislike of Jews that underlies the long and painful history of anti-Jewish sentiments and medieval superstitions. When such hatred presents Jews as eyesores, rootless foreigners, traitors, or dirty animals, it is hard for Jews to maintain their dignity, and it was easy to see Jews as vermin. Such hatred can lead to conflicts, discrimination, ghettoization, dehumanization, crusades, and pogroms. What was radical in Hannah Arendt's approach is her argument that Jew hatred is not the cause of anti-Semitism, and thus not the cause of the Holocaust or the genocide during World War II. Anti-Semitism, she says, is largely divorced from the concrete experience of and dislike of Jews. Instead, she calls it a secular ideology. Ideologies treat a complicated historical process according to a simplified idea, idea logos, the truth of an idea. The main ide ideologies that Arendt discusses in her work are anti-Semitism, racism, Darwinism, and communism. Communism is the simplified idea that all of world history can be understood according to the laws of class struggle. Similarly, anti-Semitism and Darwinism are variants of racist ideologies. As an ideology, racism makes the logical claim that race is the key to our social problems. It asserts that one group of people is the cause of all that is wrong in the world. If the Jews could simply be eliminated or African Americans enslaved, economic and political difficulties would fade away. For racists, Arendt writes, quote, the struggle between the races for world domination dominates world history. The Darwinist idea that society is a struggle between weaker and stronger, in which the stronger and more fit win out, the survival of the fittest, is what connects some versions of ideological Darwinism to racist ideologies. That anti-Semitism is a racism and is distinguished from the hatred of Jews has always struck me as capturing something right. Thus, I found it fascinating when I read and taught last year Ibram Kendi's book, Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racism in America. In that book, Kendi makes a very similar point. He argues that racism does not begin with the hate about, of black people and doesn't begin in ignorance. Instead, he says that racism begins in the need to rationalize economic and political policies that led to racial discrimination. Similarly, Arendt argues that anti-Semitism and racism begin in the need to rationalize colonialism and bureaucratic uh, mass governance of uh, lower peoples. Fed by the need to justify discrimination, and elimination, racist ideas have led to a racial imaginary that leads all people to think something is wrong with Jews or black people or other groups that suffer racism. And these racialized ideas and justifications are then mobilized repeatedly in political projects of racial hegemony. So Kendi agrees with Arendt in his view that racism does not emerge from hatred. Just as Arendt thinks Jew, Jew hatred is distinct from anti-Semitism, Kendi argues that racial hatred is not the source of racism. For both, racism emerges in the, ideological and in the ideologies and justifications that seek to rationalize oppression. But while Kendi agrees with Arendt that racism is a political use of an ideological fantasy, he offers a program of anti-racism that she would not agree with. Since racism will only end when racial discrimination ends for Kendi, anti-racism requires that we stamp out all racial discrimination and create racial equality as a fact. Arendt's thinking on anti-Semitism and racism is valuable, I think, because she insists that we understand 
that some inequality, bigotry, and racial prejudices, while they are often ugly and harmful, can in certain circumstances, and they can in circumstances lead to acts of racism, are in the end, namely prejudices and even inequality, are in the end deeply human and part of life. This does not mean that we should simply give in to prejudice and inequality, but it does mean that the goal of anti-racism cannot be to eradicate all prejudice and all inequality. Arendt argues all humans hold prejudices. We all have our prejudices. You can sit there and think what your prejudices are, and you don't have to tell anyone. For Arendt, whole battalions of enlightened orators and entire libraries of brochures will achieve nothing in the fight to end prejudice. She argues that prejudice can be fought only through politics. The effort over time to reveal the truth and the falsity that lies within prejudice. That is why at all times and in all places it is the task of politics, she writes, to shed light upon and dispel prejudices, which is not to say that the task is to train people to be unprejudiced, because that is impossible. What RN has taught me about racism is that racism has many different meanings, and that resisting racism has to begin with trying to understand it. There is ideological racism, like anti-Semitism. Racism can also mean racial prejudice, understood as deeply held attitudes or beliefs about people. If we can acknowledge our prejudices and inform them with considered judgments, we have a chance as individuals and as a society to grow, and through growth make society more ample, more possible, make a shared world in which tolerance can be replaced by community and hate by mutual respect. It is when prejudices coalesce to rigid ideologies when we, that we insist, and when we insist that in spite of evidence to the contrary, prejudice is more true than the complexity and individuality of the present moment. It is then that prejudices come to justify other manifestations of racism, discrimination, and systematic racism. And it is then that we lose ourselves and we lose the ambitions of liberal democracy into the reality of demagoguery. The actual, uh, actuality of a racist society begins with the passivity of individuals unwilling to see the roots of this failure in themselves. And it is here that racism risks becoming ideological and even systematic. In other words, Arendt has made me see racism as much more complicated and hydra-like. Her work has not offered me answers to the questions of how to respond to racism and anti-Semitism, but it has made me rethink the questions I ask. It is my hope that over the next two days you will be confronted with many different ideas of what it means to be an anti-racist or to oppose anti-Semitism. Many of these opinions will be new. Some will probably provoke you and others may shock you, but I will hope that they make you think as our students suggested. And I want to ask this question as I end, why must we think? Hannah Arendt says thinking has no worldly usefulness. When I think, I don't accomplish much. It's a conversation with myself, she says. And in a sense, it has no impact in the world. But there's one exception to that that she recognizes. She says, in times of crisis, when everyone else is swept away and caught up with movements and ideologies, when they are doing what everyone else is doing, the thinker, insofar as he or she thinks, separates herself from the crowd, stops herself and holds herself apart. And by the very act of asking questions and stopping and being different and being thoughtful, the thinker serves as an example to other people that they too can and should reflect critically and independently on what they are doing. We are today undoubtedly in terms of crisis, in times of crisis. One of the ways we're in a crisis is that we live in a time of incredible polarization, self-certainty, and thoughtlessness. If this conference inspires even a few people who will live their lives in a way that they stop and think what they are doing, I will count it a success. 
As I prepare to step down and introduce the speakers who actually know more about racism and anti-Semitism than I do, I leave you with one final thought from one of our speakers and current Hannah Arendt Center National Endowment for the Humanities, distinguished fellows, Thomas Chatterton Williams. Williams recently wrote in the New York Times, if the American university is not the space to cultivate this strong and supple liberalism, then we are in deep and lasting trouble. My hope is that over the next two days, we will all be strong enough to cultivate together a space for thinking and disagreeing and learning together. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to bring up uh, the first uh, keynote panel and speaker, John McWhorter, along with moderators Robert Boyers and Jackie Lewis. Please welcome them to stage. Folks, can you hear me? All the way in the back? All right. Do we use one of these? This might be better. All right, folks, can you hear me? If I go like this, can you hear me? All right, let's use this one. So, racism and um, its assorted forms that we talk about. What is racism? If I sit here and I tell you that racism is discriminatory feelings or actions against an individual who you feel inferior, I'm not telling you anything new. I don't think we need to have a conference about that. I think I want to jump right to what's considered step two in this discussion, which is that racism is not only a matter of personal racism, but it's also a matter of what was once called societal racism. After that, the renewal of the term was institutional racism. Today, we're encouraged to call it white supremacy. All three of those terms mean the same thing, societal racism, institutional racism, white supremacy. The idea being that it's not only a matter of somebody drawing something on a wall or somebody calling someone a dirty name or not allowing someone to become a lawyer, but that we have a system in this country where there are disparities in the achievements of people that correlate with race, and that the reason for that is racism, and that that's the kind of racism that we need to be focusing on. Now, racism 101, as in discrimination, hatred of others. I think we all agree, we don't need to think about whether or not that's a bad thing. And it needs to be battled, most certainly, including the sorts of things that have happened on this campus recently, including what happened to Tamir Rice, including that if a black person is in a doctor's office, often a doctor subconsciously thinks that black people tolerate pain more easily than white people. These things need to be not just talked about, but battled. However, if we're talking about racism in a broader sense, if we're anxious to say, as many people are, that no, it's not just that kind of racism, which frankly is kind of easy, but also institutional racism that we need to battle. I'm really worried about how we use that term these days. I think that our use of the term institutional racism is counterproductive, and I don't just mean that it makes people angry. I mean that it ends up denying people who've been left behind the help that they need, and this is why. Institutional racism. It refers to the fact that there are disparities in society, that black people have less of various things than white people. I'm oversimplifying and saying that it's only about black and white, but I'm sure you understand why. So, that's the issue. Now, I'll say that to call person-to-person -person racism and institutional racism variations on the same thing is very dangerous. It's counterproductive in the way that I mentioned. And some people will say, well, no, when we say institutional racism, it's an extended use 
of the word racism. What we're referring to is the disparities. That's different from something being written on a wall. So it's a different kind of racism. Maybe we're calling it racism, but we know that it's not the same thing. But no, you don't. You don't. That's actually not true because the issue is that there are these disparities in society because of racism ultimately of the person to person kind. The idea isn't that the disparities in society are by chance, clearly, and if it's not that it's by chance, what else is it supposed to be? It's racism. And it's not that institutional racism is because of something as faceless as institutional racism. The idea is that institutional racist disparities are due in some way, either in the past or the present, but mostly the present, to racist discrimination against human beings that has some kind of aggregate effect. So what that means is that when we say institutional racism, it triggers the same brain responses as saying just racism. If you want an analogy, think about implicit association tests where we learn that someone shown a black face is more likely to think of words like angry and ignorant than if they're shown a white face. These things are often subconscious, such as racist bias. We all understand that? Same thing with the terms societal racism and institutional racism. What we think of is just racism. And so this is why that's a problem. If we hear those terms and we think, therefore, that our job is to respond with the same gut, with the same parts of the brain, with the same sometimes almost unconstructive indignation as we respond to one-to-one -one racist discrimination, this is the problem with it. It's not just that it's messy or that I don't like it for some random reason. It means that poor black people don't get less poor. So this is the nut of what I'm going to say, and I'm not going to talk for too long. There are two things. There's battling racist discrimination, which is one of the evils of the human condition, and we should lessen it as much as we can. But then there's also political activism. There's helping people who've been left behind. And you're often taught, especially you, <laughs> that battling this is the same thing as battling that. And it's not. And I'm going to put it in a very specific way. Unequal outcomes do not always stem from unequal opportunity. They don't. I almost wish they did, because then our job as people interested in changing society would be easier. But life is almost never easy. Unequal outcomes do not always stem from unequal opportunity due to racism. Let's add that codicil. They don't. In fact, they usually don't. I know a lot of you don't want to hear it, but I'm sorry, it's true. And that means that we need to get rid of that simplistic sense that if there are disparities, they're due to something we would call racism and deserve the same kind of response that we would give to a swastika on the wall. And the reason we don't want that is because it leaves people poor. What the hell is he talking about? This. Let's say that there is a lousy inner city school. Most of the students in it are black or Latino. Nobody does much learning. Now, we're conditioned today to say that that's racism that's creating the conditions of that school. And so what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate racism, and that'll make the school better. No. That's not why that school is such a lousy place. Now, starting in the 1960s, that school started to become lousy after having been a good one for a long time because of white flight from the neighborhood, which ended up eating the property tax base. That was racism, but it was 50 and 60 years ago. If we're talking about now here in 2019, the question is whether eliminating racism will fix that school. We can't go back to 1959. So what's doing in the school now? It's much more complicated than racism. I wish it weren't, but it is. And if we want to help the children in that school, we've got to think more largely than being an anti-racist. The reason being, not that Ibram Kendi's book isn't interesting, but because we want to help those children in the school and their parents. So what's wrong with the school? One thing that's wrong with the school, which today is run by black people, which is another chink in the idea that racism is the issue. But it's run by black people, and education schools are what taught most of the teachers there. 
And since about 1969, most education schools in the United States don't teach teachers how to teach. Instead, they often teach teachers about liberal and leftist ideology, and they explicitly tell teachers that their job is to teach children how to see the world as a good-hearted political activist. Now, that comes from a good place in the heart, but a lot of those teachers, through no fault of their own, have been grievously undertrained by an education school orthodoxy that is extremely anti-racist. The people who run these schools think of themselves as fighting the good fight, but it means that they're teachers who forget that they don't know how to keep order. They don't know how to teach anybody how to read. They don't know how to teach anybody math. I have a very snooty voice. I am not criticizing the teachers. They can't help it. The ed schools let them down. But that is a much larger percentage of why that school doesn't work than that somebody doesn't like black people. Or another reason that school doesn't work is because most of the kids come from homes where they only had one parent. Now that can work, but it's pretty clear that it's better for there to be two parents around in some way. But really, with most of those kids, there's no dad. Where's dad? Dad's in jail. Why is dad in jail? Probably because of something having to do with drugs. Why is he in jail? Because of something having to do with drugs? Because there's a ridiculous war on drugs that puts people up the river for long periods of time for reasons that don't make any sense. All of that started in the late 60s and was reinforced in the early 90s, this war on drugs. Now, your impulse is to say racism, especially with this whole business of Kamala Harris <laughs> dumping on Joe Biden, et cetera, lately. No, no, no. In the late 60s, and especially in the early 90s, those drug laws were heartily espoused by very black people, including the ones living in communities where these sorts of activities were going on and making life difficult, including many members of the Congressional Black Caucus who don't quite know what to say about it now. We don't have crystal balls. We can't know what's going to happen. But these draconian drug laws, which are a terrible thing, were something that a lot of serious race people were behind. You're not told that very much, and I understand why, so I'm telling you. And what that means is that the war on drugs that has helped make it so hard to keep order in a school like that is not something you can simply dismiss as racist, even if some of the people who formulated it were somewhat. You can find some evidence of that. Black people liked the war on drugs. So I think that if you're going to make black people less poor, then one thing you need to do is devote all of your heart and soul to eliminating the war on drugs. For those of you who are under a certain age, if you haven't done it yet, watch The Wire. Watch especially the first and the third seasons of The Wire and watch what the war on drugs does to black communities and see what you need to fight. And it is not how white people feel about black people. It's that law. Now, let's pull the camera back out. I'm talking about that school. So you look at that school and you see all these black people being screwed over by a bad education and you think that's racist. No, that's oversimplified. It's so oversimplified that you end up not being in a position to help the kids in the school. That's why we need to be careful of the way we think about institutional racism and the usage of that term. Now there are a couple quick examples. You can have a grand old time, this has been the fashion since about 2013, of teaching white people to acknowledge their privilege. Because yeah, you whites in the audience, you are privileged. I, you certainly are, and I hope you know it. But this business of white people with their hands up in the air as if they're in church talking about how privileged they are, what that creates is that. I've been watching that happening for six years and I don't see anything changing. It creates that. And in the meantime, talk about that school what a lot of those kids need is to be taught, you're going to be bored for a second. They need to be taught to read via phonics instead of the whole word method. I'm sorry that sounds so inconsequential, but that is something that's being done to especially kids from bookless homes who are disproportionately children of color. Every day they're being taught to read by just looking at the whole word and guessing, which is something that really doesn't work if you're not raised in a print-rich environment. That is something that ed schools are taught, and they're taught it as a kind of social justice because it's better for dark-skinned kids to learn to be creative. Hmm, okay. Talk about what racism kind of is. But if you agitate for that school to use phonics instead of the whole word method, 
to teach kids to read? I've seen it. It's available for you to see online how that turns a school upside down within two or three years, right there. If you can't read, then you're not going to be good at math, and next thing you know, you're in jail, <laughs> to be rhetorical. You need to espouse phonics. But that doesn't get as much attention as being an anti-racist, et cetera, because it lacks the drama. But we're not supposed to be interested in drama. We're supposed to be interested in changing people's lives. So we have people attesting to their white privilege while kids are being taught to read badly. That's injustice right there. Or you know, we have the latest celebrity who says something tacky about race. Sometimes it's the president. And we have to talk about that for two weeks. And we have to talk about how racism always rears its ugly head. Blah, 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 blah. Now, in the meantime, there are long-term acting reversible contraceptive devices. They should be available free to any woman who wants them, especially poor women. Poor women are disproportionately black. No, I'm not talking about eugenics. Black women like these devices. They actually agitate for more. There are three thorough academic studies that demonstrate that. Five years, you don't have to worry about anything that you're doing, but you have a child when you want one. A lot of entrenched poverty is based on issues of family planning. They're called LARCs, L-A-R-C. Not exciting, I know, that's not as exciting as talking about racism, but more LARCs would mean happier and more successful black people. We should talk about that, phonics, LARCs. If you want some excitement, Battle the war on drugs. That's exciting. Battle that. It can be done. It's already melting. You know, the attitudes about marijuana are changing. The ideas for attitudes about, yes, cocaine and heroin and everything else to change. It would turn black America upside down. But instead, we are taught that our job is to think about institutional racism and to be upset about it and to battle racism as if this kind of racism were the same thing as inequities in society. Societal inequities that are based on race do not usually trace to racism in the sense that we know it. And anybody who tells you that is oversimplifying. Now, quick sidebar. Talking about this kind of racism, this kind of open discrimination, it must be battled, but to an extent, depending on what kind we mean, I would like to say that there is an extent to which if somebody calls you a dirty name or scrawls something on a wall, your job is to look down on that person. Your job is not to look at that and pretend injury. I've been called a nigger a couple times, and as far as I was concerned, it meant that I was superior. The minute it came out of that person's mouth, I thought, huh, I'm better and I walked away. As I got a little older, I realized that I was supposed to fall down on the bed and cry and start talking about slavery. No, that would make me a weak person. And I'm a person of ordinary strength. Notice, I'm not telling you, be strong. I'm telling you, be yourselves. You're being taught to pretend that you're weaker than you are. If somebody scrawls something on a wall, think about what an ugly, pick-nosed piece of shit that person is, and move along. Now, if somebody is hurting you, it's different. I'm not talking about somebody abusing you physically. Of course, there's a where do you draw the line in terms of how often this sort of abuse is going to come. But if we're talking about those pass passive, quiet sorts of things every now and then, when I was in college, which was not that long ago at this point, well, if somebody scrawled something on the wall, you just thought, bastard, and you moved on. That did not make it a different time. There was color then. It was just like now. Everything was in color. There was sex. It was not 1917. And yet, that is the way we thought of it, and it is the way people should think of it now. Don't let anybody, adult or child, lower you to pretending to be hurt. That's a sidebar. Now, I'm going to wrap up. The... Um, upshot of all of this is, I want you to take away three things because three is the magic number. Unequal outcomes are not always due to unequal opportunity due to race. I think all of you understand what I mean on a gut level, but we're taught that when it comes to the descendants of African slaves, we're supposed to suspend our sense of judgment and logic. I think that that's a terrible idea. And I know 
that a lot of black people have learned to hear something like that and take it as a compliment. The idea being that it's somehow advanced to think of a cry of weakness as a form of strength. That starts roughly with Stokely Carmichael in 1966. It is not the way race activism has to be. It wasn't the way race activism was before then. And it's a detour. Weakness is not strength. Second thing, I have oversimplified nothing. So I know that that will be one of the criticisms that I'm oversimplifying. But what do you mean? Do you mean that I haven't done a recitation of the horrors of racism? Because I can do it. I can say Tamir Rice, I can say the hospital office, I can talk about car insurance discrepancies with the same sorts of people. I can give you a whole recitation of all of those things, but I'm not here to give you a liturgy. This isn't church. I'm here to tell you how I think we might go about making life better for poor black people, not to mention poor Latino people. My recitation of those horrors does not create that. We are not in church. So, if I've oversimplified, then you need to think back to what I said about that inner city school. And whether you agree with what I said, I wasn't oversimplifying. I was trying for a bit of detail and nuance. So, make sure that oversimplify isn't really a synonym for just that you don't agree. I'm not being simplistic. And third, this is something I want you to remember, because it's true. If you pretend to accept that unequal outcomes are always due to unequal opportunity, and you let that kind of reasoning pass when you wouldn't let it pass in any other discipline or endeavor that you're engaged in, if you think that that kind of reasoning is somehow plausible and permissible when it comes to black people, then quite unintentionally, you're being racist. I mean it. I'm gonna finish it by saying it one more time because I'm not pulling that back. I mean exactly what I said. If you accept that unequal outcomes are always due to unequal opportunity based on racism, knowing full well on some level that that's a kind of reasoning that you wouldn't apply anywhere else in your life. Whatever color you are, you're being a racist. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yes? Uh, I'm Bob Boyers. Um, uh, in the course of this, uh, this session, uh, I'll speak for a few minutes to John's remarks, after which Reverend Lewis uh, will do the same. Uh, we'll put some questions to John, and after he has a chance to respond to us, we'll turn to the audience for uh, questions. Um, so we're, we all know that we're assembled this morning to uh, address important questions about uh, racism and anti-Semitism, and to consider how we can respond to uh, what one of the prompts we received uh, calls racist fantasies. But the work that John McWhorter has done in a wide range of books and articles asks us also to think about what we can do to speak truthfully and honestly about the realities we confront how we can avoid the myths and formulas we often resort to. The tendency to settle for myths has seemed to John an important feature of the landscape, and so he has sought to identify the sources of that predilection and the consequences. A few years ago, for example, John wrote for the Daily Beast a brilliant piece on the myth of Ferguson anatomizing what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, in an incident that spurred a furious debate about black America's relationship with the police. In effect, John asks in that essay why so many of us were invested in myths and distortions that made it hard, if not impossible, to talk about what actually happened in Ferguson, and about how Michael Brown, who was shot by a police officer, managed to become a symbol for all sorts of things people cared deeply about. But that 
hideous episode was not the only incident to be turned into a myth and to be talked about in misleading ways. John has written on a great many other myths that thwart our efforts to talk honestly about race and racism. He asks why the preoccupation with white privilege has seemed so central to recent debates on race relations, and he has wondered whether that preoccupation has not led us away from the kinds of activism we want if our present situation is to improve. Is it not the case, John has asked, that white privilege has come to assume the status of what he calls original sin, and that a great many of us have placed extraordinary hope in the idea that if white people can be made to atone for their very condition as white people, all sorts of benefits for black people will follow. Is there not a species of mythical thinking in the notion that white privilege is a unitary phenomenon shared in by all white people who enjoy the benefits of whiteness in more or less the same ways. And of course, there are many other varieties of myth in which good people are also invested. Is it true, John asks, that Ta-Nehisi Coates is speaking truthfully when he tells us that America's progress on race has been minimal and that there is little hope for further improvement. Coates's pessimism, John has written, qualifies as a kind of performance art and is disconnected from the kind of pragmatic engagement with reality that we ought to insist upon. And so, I want to ask John to speak here uh, a bit further about the large investment many of us, white and black, have made in varieties of mythical thinking and in performance art. <laughs> You're reminding me of things I forgot I wrote, but no, the, the performance art um, line, that may seem flippant and a little mean, but I meant it, unfortunately. <laughs> That's exactly what I meant. And what I mean is this, and I can imagine being part of this if I were on the other side of the line. I don't think this is horrific. I think it's gotten to the point where for educated white America, it's gotten to the point where the idea is to show that you're a good person by taking in the liturgy, rather than helping people who need help. I think that if we could go back in time, I almost wish Spike Lee would make a movie where we went back, not to say 1916, but just to 1966, and talked to white people who would ask black civil rights leaders, what can we do to help? And I'm not saying that everybody is supposed to be like the people who went down to the South and got killed, et cetera, but what can we do to help? Whereas today, more of it is, I feel your pain and I'm not a racist, and then everybody goes home. That's not what it was supposed to be. And so that's what I'm calling performance art. And this is gonna be equally unwelcome. I think that for a lot of black people, there is, there's a hole inside of us. I think that given 350 years of abuse, it could be hard to have a real sense of pride, a really strong self-image. And so I think that since about 1966, it really was that year, maybe 65, there's been an idea that the way that you feel good about yourself is to be the noble victim. The idea is, I go through this abuse every day, my people have been through this, I can call you on this, and that's how you feel important, rather than generating it from within yourself. Now, of course, there's the idea that there's Mother Africa, but frankly, black Americans are too far from Africa for that to be meaningful. But then if we try to look at our history, what we're taught about is basically slavery and Selma, and it's hard to be proud of that, even if there are certain inventors. It's not enough. And so I think that there's a sense that we have our blackness as something to wield as noble victimhood, rather than as a way of being proud and moving on. So yes, that's what I meant by that, and I know how it sounds. I know I'm, I'm not the person to be saying it. I'm too educated, I've got the wrong demeanor, but I'm sorry, I still think I'm right. And my concern 
is that I want poor black people to be less poor. And I'm just not seeing it happening with the way we're quote unquote talking about race today. Well, hello. <laughs> I'm Jackie Lewis. I'm Dr. Jackie Lewis. I'm the Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis. That means that I traffic in faith stuff and theological stuff and God language, but I also traffic in psychological language. Um, I'm an African-American person raised in this country, so I traffic in our narrative. And rather than going back to some of the beautiful writings I've read of John's, I want to um, talk a little bit about the power of stories and the way John was truly complexifying a narrative today. I've always appreciated that. When I was, uh, so stories, let's do that. Howard Gardner, in a book called Leading Minds, which you must read, young people, it should be your Bible. It should be next to every book that you love the most, from Harry Potter to whatever it might be. Um, you should read it. He studied 14 leaders and came to the conclusion that leaders tell compelling stories that change the story. Leaders tell stories that change the story that's already at work in the minds of followers. And the stories that they tell that have the most impact are the stories that answer existential questions. Do I matter? Who am I? Can I make a difference in the world? Uh, stories of identity, stories of meaning, stories of belonging. He studied uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He studied Margaret Thatcher and 12 other folks. Um, I think there's something to that. I think there's something really powerful to that. Um, he says that leaders who tell these stories have to have a kind of coherence and cohesiveness between what they say and what they do. They gotta walk the talk, they gotta walk the talk. So when I hear John talk, and I think about decades of reading his stuff when we were both children in writing, because we, we're precocious, right John? And we were five years old writing books. Seven. For yeah. Seven years old writing books. Um, I think about there's something consistent and coherent and cohesive about the way John talks about race. But, but let, me, let me talk about race a little bit from my vantage point for just a few seconds. Um, not, not in disagreement to complexify narratives. I'm five years old when Lisa, blonde, pixie, green-eyed girl, moves from Mississippi to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where I lived on an Air Force base with my parents. I wasn't in the Air Force, they were, but I had to live with them. So that's how that went. And Lisa comes from Mississippi and crushes my little happy, well-adjusted little life where I am the only Negro in the class, we were Negroes then, and Tommy Holly and Tommy Hollister, blonde-haired and then red-haired white boys, were my thing. They were my jam. They were, I, they were my posse. I was handling my business. They were carrying lunch boxes to and fro the cafeteria. I was the queen of their world. Can you hear me? Until Lisa came. Y'all just didn't look like you were having a reaction to my posse. I'm like, can they hear me describing my world? It was amazing. Important. I had power and whatnot. And then Lisa came and explained to them that I was a nigger and that my chocolate milk came from my mother's tits. I don't know which one hurt my feelings the most, John. Like chocolate milk from the tits? I, th I was like, what is a tit and what is happening with the milk? <laughs> but I went home to tell my mom and dad this little story of horror about how Lisa cracked up my life. And my mom had the talk that lots of black parents, Negro parents then, have with their Negro children. And she said it like this with her grew up in Louisville, Mississippi self, singing in the choir with Fannie Lou Hamer. She was like, this is the stupidest thing, Jack. She called me Jack. You won't believe how stupid this is. But some people won't like you just because of the color of your skin. That's how she put it to me. I was like, oh, yeah. So kind of like John's Where's Our Confidence, mommy was like, that's so stupid. I was like, jam, that's right. And that is the story that has stayed with me about racism all my life. It is so stupid that somebody would think I'm not a badass because I'm black, right? It's so stupid to think that somebody would think that John wasn't a badass because he's black. That's where that story went inside me. But I was hurt. And I did hit the floor that night in my Now I Lay Me Down prayers and prayed, God, please let it be that no matter what color people are, they will be loved and accepted. I told you I traffic in God talk and psychological talk. My black parents from Mississippi, poor and black from Mississippi, 
somehow got stuck in, some, in them, interjected would be the psychological word, in them, though black, though poor, though living on a farm, my dad, though living in town, my mom, though absent fathers, single mothers, both raised them, can y'all still, right? They somehow received, and I think from their faith talk, I think from being black in the South, in the black church in the South, that they were extraordinarily made in the image of God, that there was nothing that the world could take away from them, that not only was heaven going to be their reward, they were charged with making heaven here on earth right now, that the Lord's prayer was a call to arms, to disrupt all the junk, to make, to make Jim Crow go away, to make poverty go away to equalize the playing field. They took seriously the prophetic words that the crooked places would be made straight and that the high places would be made low and that all of God's people would see the end time together. They were totally turned on that as poor black people, they still had power because they were made in the image of God. That's the Theo talk. The psych talk is that somehow their poor black mothers stuck into them, gave them an imprint that they could interject, that their power and their beauty and their giftedness had nothing to do with what white people thought about them and had everything to do with their just being a human being created in the image of God. And so, though they could have been crippled, by the racism and the Jim Crow and the walking across the street from the white people, from the segregation, from the walking 13 miles to the so-called black school and going past the school around the corner, though that could have crippled them, their psyches were strong and they were not damaged by the systematic racism in America, by the institutional racism in America, because the particular energy for them as black people in their black community was y'all are all ours and we're a village and we're raising you and we love you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Leaders tell stories that change the story. Thomas Jefferson, in the first book he wrote, maybe the only real book he wrote, Notes on the State of Virginia, Speaking of stories, y'all, I hate Jefferson's myth as some founding democratic father. Writing to the French about African American people, I, have the inter I just have the sense that they're inferior to us. It's not based on the fact that we snatched them from the shores of Africa and enslaved them. It's actually just inherently that they're inferior those African people. And that book, exported around the globe, becomes the story that shapes race science, so-called eugenic science. The lie of white supremacy begins with the founding father and his democratic butt. Is that scholarly enough? And so for all of the time, the justification of a black body as to be hated, to be feared, as inherently inferior. This is the narrative at work. Yes, in the 1969 school, and yes, in the, in the uh, 2019 school. Yes, John is right that the narrative is complex. It's not just that, but it is that, that a white teacher will not call on a black kid because of course he doesn't know, and because he's scary. Yes, it is that, that black children are treated like criminals when they behave like five-year-old mis misanthropes. It is true that that story of black inferiority infects, shapes, bruises white people's souls and black people's souls and Latino and Asian souls. And let's not forget that this nation is built on stolen land. My particular New York town, my particular Dutch Reformed church, we are the people, not me, I wasn't there. We are the people who took the land from the Lenapes for $27 or some kind of thing. And so we cannot forget that America's original sin is the idea that we're going to get in a boat and go discover something that is already inhabited. I'm trying to tell a story that changes the story. I'm trying to say way before we get to Lenape and Navajo and Apache having their land taken, let's go across the pond 
And let's go to how white Europeans decided to appropriate a chosenness narrative that is honed in Judaism, just to complex it a little more. That the people of God chosen by God, talking theotalk now, God creates a people for God to love. I will be your God, I will be your people. That's the founding story. Abraham, go. I'm going to make you the father of a nation. Okay, two. Jews and Muslims, both from Abraham's seed. Yes. Ishmael and Isaac. Let's put Ishmael first for once. And this idea that God chose Israel through whom to bless all the nations. God creates a people, chooses a people, loves a people. They have to create a theology and a psychology, gentlemen, for why, since God loves them so much, they keep getting their behind whipped by the nations. What's that about? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. God loves me enough to let me, you know, you know, be destroyed by Canaan and Babylon. I don't know. Anyway, the promise of being God's people and the promise of a land and the theology of chosenness, appropriate for those people. Maybe so. But by the time Joshua gets to Canaan and decides, since there's a promise to keep, I get to do genocide on a people to have the land, we now have a problem with chosenness. If I was a church, somebody would say amen. We have a problem of chosenness. I'm, just, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying if Joshua can kill the people to take the land and the white Europeans watch that and say, chosenness means I can take the land, suddenly we've got the doctrine of discovery and we've got white people on boats coming to America, taking the land that belongs to somebody and it's all good because God said it was okay. Somebody say amen. amen. This is a problem with the story. It's a problem with the story. It's a problem with the story that God is on the side of only a few of us. It's a problem with the story that makes God create some people superior and inherently inferior. It makes me, a Christian pastor, want to repent that those stories are embedded in the texts I preach and somehow uncritically leave us today with white Christian pastors both still anti-Semitic and thinking God didn't choose the Jews that somehow we're supposed to be against the Jews when God came to earth in the body of a Jew named Jesus, Yeshua, Ben Joseph. How problematic is that story, young people? <laughs> it's a problem when white clergy will still preach that somehow justice doesn't go with Jesus. What? <laughs> what does it mean to be feeding the sheep and caring for the poor and I don't understand. Embedded in the story, they say, is the intention for some people to be rich and some people to be poor. Intended that black bodies wouldn't be received as well as white bodies. Intended that immigrants from Mexico wouldn't be welcomed into this land of the free and the home of the brave. I got a problem with these stories. And you should too. I'm going to stop there for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I want to say is that it is true that there are these biases that you're talking about, and I didn't talk about them much because I wanted to focus everybody's attention on what it means to change a lot of those things. And so, for example, Jackie, it is true that a teacher will look upon the black boy and just immediately come in with certain preconceptions, and that is not just. What worries me about that situation is that I'm not sure that telling the teacher not to be racist works. Like, if it would work, that'd be fine. But, you know, that's kind of been in the orthodoxy for about 50 years, and it doesn't really seem to change. And so my sense of it is, well, you know, one thing that might be better is if we change what the educational strategies are so that this kid, and I've seen that kid and that teacher. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, that's, that's there. What do you do about it? And I think that to an extent, I didn't say this, but I will say this. To an extent, telling people not to be racist stops working. It seems to me that there are three phases. First, it's 1950, and most white people are out and out bigots. 
So then the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 65 is voting, and then equally important, this one doesn't have as much drama, 68, fair housing. Now it's not like the world turns upside down, but that made my life possible, that made your life Absolutely. possible. So it's illegal to say you can't be a lawyer here, you can't sit here, that's stage one. Then there's stage two, which I grew up in as a kid and teenager, which I always think of as symbolized by the Norman Lear sitcoms, which to you guys are now ancient, ancient, but to a lot of you here, all in the family and Maud and good times, my mother was a social work teacher. That would surprise many people. My mother, throughout my childhood, taught at Temple University a course literally called, because this wasn't funny yet, it was called Racism 101. She taught it for years and she taught me that course. And we used to watch those Norman Lear sitcoms where white people learned not only not to be segregationist, but to change their hearts. So Archie Bunker, for the, those of you who are younger, Archie Bunker was basically a character who was Donald Trump in a sitcom. That's what it was. Just imagine Donald Trump, except he's a family man. And the idea was... That's good, John. That's what that was. And the idea was to teach Archie not to be a racist, and it never quite worked. But you learned from that era. I remember parties in my mother's and father, make it sound like it wasn't my own mother, in our living room, you know, with the canapes and the Harvey Wallbanger cocktails and stuff, where there are white people and black people, and my mother was teaching white people that they're racist deep down, which they often were, and so there's that lesson. Then there's this new lesson we're trying to teach where we try to teach people to be even less racist. I, it looks to me like it doesn't work. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it, that what's the point, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It's that I don't think anything more can be taught. And so that's why my idea is let's kind of go under the rug and behind it and try to make things different. Everything you're saying is true, but people are suffering and I'm always interested in seeing how we can alleviate that. I really appreciate that, John. And I think that when I, when I celebrate the way you're complexifying that narrative, always, I mean that. There has got to be something more than with the, the uh, porn, pornographic confessions of white supremacy. That was perfect. Wasn't that good? Yes, mm -hmm. that was perfect. But if you say it again, you have to attribute it to me. I'll put a little R on it. Put a little yeah. R there. But there's something kind of pornographic and kind of like voyeuristic, like, who's a racist? I'm a racist, you're a racist, everybody. And everybody's like, and they feel really good about it. We got to do more than that, right? Yes. We really have to, to be, have a complex analysis of these complex situations. And each of us has to be an advocate for a better story. So in John's classroom example, where the boy, I've made him today, raises his hand and the teacher doesn't see. Yeah, we need better education for teachers in their, co in their colleges, but we need better education for pre-K. We need better education for pre-K, where students get to learn with and from each other, where textbooks reflect reality, where we teach people that to be a citizen of the globe is a high calling. And then I think it's just one beginning space. I drank your water. I don't have a cold. You may drink it or get a fresh one back there. Do you understand what I'm saying? We've got to start way sooner. And you've got to start at your dinner table when you go home for Thanksgiving. Every day, that you let come out of somebody's mouth that is followed by some kind of prejudice, oversimplified uh, stereotype of anybody that's not you, what's your job? How do you disrupt that? What do you read? What do you point to? How do you excavate the, the way we traffic in simple, biased junk every single day that guides our reactions to and with each other? How do you do that? That was a question for them, but I don't know if that's appropriate. <laughs> I, uh, I, I noted in the, um, in, in the story in the New York Times a, a couple of weeks ago, um, something about a bias training uh, program for New York City employees, yeah. which bears upon the kind of work that's being done in schools, not just inner city schools, but schools across the board yeah. um, in New York City. And this uh, program declares that um, terms like individualism and objectivity are forms of white supremacy, uh, supremacy and therefore should be avoided by all employees. And that 
um, sort of struck me as um, sort of the, the wrong way um, to conduct business um, in the school system by telling people that uh, certain terms, ordinary terms that mean different things to different people um, are simply to be prescribed and eliminated. Uh, from usage. Oh, this, this yeah. is, that's, that's crucial. It, that's, okay. John's going to love that. Here's a, a, a story. <laughs> so, where that fits in is that in New York City, sorry, Jackie, in New York City, the top public schools only let you in based on your performance on a rather rigorous and stupid standardized test. That's the way it's been since the dawn of time. Now, these days, take the flagship of the flagship, Stuyvesant High School. I think eight black kids were admitted. There are hundreds and hundreds eight. of slots, and there are only eight black kids. Now, the impulse is to say racism is the reason for that. But it's vastly oversimplified because just 25 years ago, there were plenty of black kids in those schools. And I remember, because I lived in New York then, and I knew a lot of black kids who were graduates of Stuyvesant and didn't think of it as at all unusual, also Bronx science. They were getting in then, and I think we'll all agree that racism was at least somewhat worse 25 years years ago. And so, nevertheless, pretending that that isn't true, a lot of people have said, well, then the test is racist. Now, it's true that if you looked at one of those tests 30 years ago, it might have had some questions about skiing and wine. That has not been true forever. The test is not biased at all. A, a Martian could take that test. It has so little cultural knowledge in it. So, the test is racist, though, because of the disparity. So, because black kids don't do as well on it, it is a racist, and therefore, you have to get rid of the test. No. There are many, many services in the city where you can learn how to take those stupid tests for free. Because the other kind of New York Times reader's wise idea is the white kids can have, you know, they can learn to take the test, but they can pay hundreds of dollars to learn to take the test. It's just not true. Especially because now most of the kids at Stuyvesant are struggling South Indian and East Asian immigrants kids. Those people aren't spending money to prep the, for the test. They're just prepping really hard. There are free services that a lot of the black communities in the city don't happen to know about. There are all sorts of reasons that they don't know. But you might just say, let's teach the black kids how to do well on the test. Let's bring black communities together and say, here are these services. You may not have known, you're busy, but these are the services so that the black kids can do well on the test. Say that, and many people say, oh, you're really stirring up the pot. Why? Given that 25 years ago, there were plenty of black kids who did well on that test. And you know why they stopped? Because there were certain people in the ed school establishment who decided that the gifted programs that a lot of these black kids went to were discriminatory because they took black kids who were gifted away from black kids who weren't and deprived them of the opportunity of learning in a race-identified way. Now, I can see how that made sense in about 1992, but golly, it just didn't work out. And more to the point, it wasn't racism. And so here we are today. I'm going to talk for 30 more seconds. Here we are today with Richard Carranza, the school chancellor, actually supporting an idea that what we need to do to make sure we get more black kids into schools like that is to, one, not test the kids and leave them at a disadvantage when it's time to take the SAT, but two, to have kids disidentify from supposedly white things such as objectivity, precision, and connection with the printed word. And we're being told that that's anti-racism? It won't do. I'm gonna jump right in there and say the, the words, the take the words out is magical thinking and that's crazy, that's not gonna work. I wanna say I think it actually is racism. Uh, it's actually racism or white supremacist beliefs when you think black people need to be with each other in order to feel comfortable. Uh, I've always thought that too. It is true. It's like, it's like, what's wrong with us? We somehow are like so timid and afraid that if we're not all in a herd someplace, we're not going to be okay. That actually is racist. It actually is racist. It's racist when we think it's a freakish exception for black people to be smart. That's racist. And that's at work. That's at work in this gifted school thing and the take a test thing. And just to, just to really dip way back into the past, 
it, it is true that black wealth and white wealth, isn't it like 13 times this, the wealth gap? The wealth gap between black folks and white folks in America, not that that's the only thing, and by wealth we mean what? Like the resources you have minus the debt you have? Most African American families are still upside down, meaning they are in the negative wealth. That wealth gap stems to chattel slavery. It does. It does stem to, uh, to Africans in America working for nothing for a very long time. It does stem to when the Emancipation Proclamation happens and black folks are promised 40 acres and a mule, we don't get that and we don't get any of that. It does stem to reparations where like, yay, let's have them for about a year after emancipation and then it was gone. And it does stem to redlining that happened in all the urban cities that meant you can't buy a house, can't get a house. A house is where Americans get wealth. It does stem to the fact that when GIs came home and there could be a GI bill and a GI mortgage, black people didn't get that. So I'm just gonna say what is historic white supremacy in America has led to an unequal playing ground. And I won't take that back. I have a PhD and two master's degrees, and a big old house that I bought all by myself. <laughs> so I have a lot of power. I'm talking cash money. <laughs> but the playing field is not equal. And don't let it be because Oprah is OK, and I'm OK, and John's OK, <laughs> and Michael Jordan's OK. That is OK, right? Somebody say amen. Make me feel calm. It's just not amen, true. Amen, Jackie. There's no it's sense that, the, that, oh, all the little black children could just read a little harder and then stand up a little murder, and just if those husbands would just stay at home. What? Come on. This, um, this America is not equal. So however else we think about that, if we are for affirmative action or against it, let's at least start with a shared narrative of truth. It ain't equal here. She said in love. We are going to take some questions, please. Um, yes, right up there. Speak as loudly as you can. Ah, I got a mic coming right to you. Great. I want to answer uh, Professor Berkowitz's question, can we solve racism, by answering that with a yes. Uh, my first point. Race is a physical attribute, uh, religion is not. So the subject of this conference of both anti-Semitism and racism and whether anti-Semitism is a form of racism, it's not due to the physical attribute, I don't think. I think it goes to the cultural attribute. You, you can wear race and you can wear religion on your sleeve and um, therefore if you do that, then I think you are properly subject to criticism in a fair and enlightened way. And how do we um, deal with these issues? I think we have to recognize, and, and by the way, I'm a political candidate. I'm running for district attorney in my county as an independent. My opponent is on the Democratic and Republican lines, and that's because he received the block Hasidic vote in my county, 99%. So what you have in my county is uh, religion getting entwined into politics. The reason I ran was because I learned, or am, am hearing... Yeah, why did you run? I, uh, crazy. I ran because I heard that Hasidic children, and you can read about this from Yafet and other sources, get a very deficient secular education. Oh. And, and being a, a civil rights lawyer and somebody who served in the military, I personally view education as the foundational thing. Secular education, sound secular education as a foundational thing for our democracy. My, qu my question is, <laughs> and my statement is, question. that I, th I believe that if we have sound secular education where people learn about diversity, about the science of the mind, evolutionary psychology, learn about how we work, that if everybody learns that in school, high school, college, about our evolutionary psychology, how we're all very similar, that's how we get to the root of solving both anti-Semitism and racism, and I would ask whether you agree with that proposition. With all due respect, you can't just teach it in that, in that way. I think that you, like me, like probably all of us, are a, a bookish person who is given to standing outside of reality and, and looking in. 
that is not the way most human beings will, will ever be. And I think that discrimination is something that comes very viscerally. It's something that is genetically programmed. And to simply tell someone we're all the same inside, to say that race is a biological fiction, that they're fuzzy boundaries, it doesn't really work because we still have a propensity to perceive difference and to attach qualities to those differences. And then talk about, and I'm not gonna talk forever, this is, give me 20 seconds. Things are complex. So in society, people of different colors do, on the average, behave differently. And there are reasons for that, and some of them are due to racism, some of them are just due to chance. But there are differences in the way people behave according to the color of their skin, et cetera. Any young person is gonna grow up seeing those things and use their basic cognitive capacity to generalize. I don't think we can simply teach people out of it. The question is what we do about the fact that it'll always exist. That's, that's just me. I, I would agree that, uh, that it's, we can't just teach people out of it. Um, I just wanted to say out loud, to especially the young people, have you been to the PBS website to see race, the power of an illusion? Let's write that down. I saw y'all writing things down. Race, the power of an illusion is a beautiful resource, professors, teachers at PBS, that they continue to update a way, a way to think about educating, a way to think about teaching the biology. Yeah, but we can't simply do that. We cannot, because we are looking at culture. I mean, what we're calling race in America is really ethnicity. There's only one race, and it's human. You know that. But there are, there are more than one. Oh, I love when I get a clap for that. But there's more than one ethnicity. And along with the ethnicity is physiognomy and what we see and how that looks. And there's culture. Can culture, and culture matters. Culture does matter. And amen for culture. Amen is awesome. So what I hope our project is isn't to say all cultures are equal, to say all cultures are valued and beautiful. That's a, that would be a really great place to go. And sir, I'm not positive because I'm not Jewish, but my, my, my Jewish friends would say there's a kind of religiosity about Judaism, but there's also an ethnicity component to Judaism, right? Semitic is like, right? And then we're, we're in Europe, we're in, we're in the Middle East. I mean, we, the, 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 the Arabs are Semites, the Jews are Semites. So there is a racial component to what is Judaism. And I think that race part is what got the Jews uh, so maligned uh, over history. That, that's what I think. I'm not sure. That's great. We have a question here. Yes. Way down. Do you want to use my mic? <laughs> here we are. There was a time when everybody knew how to yell. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Nasira Ganif. I come from Paris, France. I teach as a professor education sciences. And I would want maybe to reflect and center the conversation by bringing in not just France, but Europe and uh, West African, North African, Turkish, et cetera, et cetera, students that were and are still in the French schooling system about what you said. So I couldn't agree more about the fact that it's very important to teach students, um, um, you know, syllabic system of learning language. And but coming from this experience of having been doing ethnog ethnography in uh, a suburban area of France that would eventually become worldwide known because it, this is where the 2005. Um, revolts against racist French system started. It's called Clichy sous bois Montfermé. I started to uh, do ethnography there in, two, in you know, 1982 and following teachers at the primary school level, et cetera, et cetera. I want to make it short. So because of what they noticed back then, there's, they started to implement some sort of a national program of trying to, what they would call, um, bring some equality in all these schools. But here we are, 2019, and you have this labor union of teachers at the national level that are starting to um, bring programs about structural and institutional racism in the schooling system in France to their fellow teachers because they have noticed that it has failed. 
it was not enough to bring those black and Arab and all those students out of the kind of discrepancies and lack of opportunity that uh, a lot of French students and immigrant students are experiencing in France. So I would rather say that one is not exclusive of the other. And, and in order to understand how the schooling system should, should change, then uh, we should support those teachers that want to understand something about the way they are experiencing, not only as teachers, but you know, with regard to their students, uh, everyday racism, microaggressions, and so on and so forth. Just to finish, this very labor union is under the threat of becoming criminalized in France and being terminated on the request, upon the, the request of some representatives at the French parliament because they call them racist. I just wanted to leave you with that. And I very much appreciate your N answer. Nasira, this is, it, it really you. comes down to this. I lack any nuanced sense of the contours of this in France. I mean, I'm calling it nuanced. I don't know. I know what I read in the paper. But, simply this. Let's say that you have teachers who are now learning about, you know, institutional racisme institutionnel or something like that, and le privilège blanc, et cetera. So now all of that is gonna be done in French. Now, take a look at the schools in 10 years. Frankly, it's not gonna make a bit of difference. And if it doesn't, then there needs to be a reset. Now, I could be wrong. It could be that in 10 years, you start seeing an uptick in the scores. The Tunisian kid feels less alienated. Great, I'm not sure why that would happen there, but not here. But as goodly as that sounds, says the American who's never been, I know, but as goodly as that sounds, I don't think that it's gonna make the schools better. In which case, the French educational establishment should move on. And just to add, just as another hand goes up, and what will happen then, I think, to support John's, you know, complex narratives, then we look around and go, oh, that failed. And when it fails, there is an intractable reaction to the failing. There is some kind of reaction to the failing that I think is why we want to say black kids shouldn't go to the white school anyway after all. It's not going to do any difference, right? It's an insidious self-perpetuating dynamic that happened, that I think does happen around the globe. I have time for another question here. Sir, yeah. Uh, can we get a microphone over here? Thank you. They can't pick it up. Oh. Yeah, my name, okay. My name is Tarcisio, um, and um, uh, John, this question for you or for everyone there. Um, I enjoyed your great course. Um, Thank you. The story of the language. Like my happy things. Yeah. <laughs> yes. First of all, I got to know you on the, on the language world. The story of language, everyone should listen to that. And great course. Very good. And then eventually I saw you at a, a, a discussion and you asked a question for George Peterson. Uh, and you were really challenging him. Jordan. That was that one moment. Frankly, I was drunk. And that just <laughs> went... <laughs> <laughs> went all over the internet, but I'm glad you saw it. No, I just heard, I was, I was driving, and I heard this person <laughs> asking a very incisive question to Jordan Peterson to, you know, for him to give a more precise answer. It's like, that voice, it sounds familiar. And I remember for the great course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, I love how you pressed him um, to answer your question. Um, so I'm from Brazil, you know, I have a grandmother, she's black, my stepfather's black. And I grew up, um, actually, I was always bullied, bullied by uh, this black kid. And he would make me cry every single time. Because uh, to be white was over, sort of like to be like, uh, weaker. Uh, there was this kind of idea. Uh, and, but I couldn't react to him. I couldn't say anything. Because I couldn't attack him for the color of his skin. I didn't have that in my mind. Until I was 16, and it's like, oh, okay. I could have attacked the, him with prejudice and racist comments, right? But I didn't have that in my mind, although he was attacking me in that way. But anyway, so I live there. In Brazil, it's very mixed. There is racism and all that. Um, so it's just a little bit of a 
context. But my question for you, John, is how much of the words of the president has a relationship with the events, let's say, that happened at Bard College and Simon's Rock. Do you think there is a correlation with that? Or, or, or do you think perhaps when you see a lot of media is an inflation of what happens uh, with in respect to black people, like cops stopping black people and so on and so forth? It's hard to draw a correlation. I mean, there certainly do seem to be people who feel that Trump's open attitudes make open expression of bigotry more acceptable. I'm not aware that there was so much less of that sort of thing before. I mean, this is a conversation we could have been having five years ago, 10 years ago, and we, we, we were. And I think there's something that people need to think about in terms of hate groups. And a hate group is really scary, but we need to think about this. When carriages started being replaced by cars in the early 20th century, there were these clubs that started, horse and buggy clubs. There were people who liked their carriages. You know, it was mostly rich people, but suddenly it became a thing to keep your chariot. People started collecting them. Now, you could have looked at those clubs and thought, there's an uptick in chariots because there are all these, these clubs, these people who are keeping their chariots, when really it was the cars that were taking over. We need to consider that even if there's an uptick in those groups, part of it is because so much of the rest of the country no longer feels that way. And so if you're that kind, you become part of a club. And so, for example, Emmett Till was not killed by a hate group. He was killed by white people for whom that was ordinary. You can look at the newsreels of the wives just standing there next to their husbands, just nodding. It was normal. Now, you have to get together into some stupid little hate group in order to promulgate this sort of thing because you are special. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't make these people really scary and that they don't need to be monitored, but I think sometimes we think it's getting worse, it's getting worse, when really it's just that there are ever fewer people like that, and so they band together and they call themselves something. But when you say Brazil, very quickly, it's interesting. Race is so much more fluid in Brazil, and that doesn't mean that it's not harder to be darker. <laughs> but I find it very interesting, as will Thomas Chatterton Williams, who's right behind you, that um, in this country, the minute I say that, for some people, they want you to talk about that the people in the favelas are mostly black. And we're not supposed to talk about an ideal where race is thought of as more fluid. Anybody who says anything about Brazil in America is thought of as being a little bit naive. What we're really supposed to be thinking about is how people feel about the very darkest. Where really, in this country, we need to move on to an idea that if we're going to get past race, the notion that, for example, and Thomas, I don't want to steal anything that you're going to say, but that you know, my daughter, my, actually at this point, former wife was, she still exists, is white. And so my daughter is, there are two daughters, but one of them is about your color. And she is biracial. She's partly white and she's partly black. There's this orthodoxy that says that she's supposed to think of herself as African American. In 2019, that is absurd. It's supposed to be more like Brazil, but I'm not supposed to say that. Quick, quick, quickly behind what John just said, go to look up racial identity development. If you Google racial identity development, you'll see there's some great writers on that, uh, Robert Carter, um, Janet Helms, but there's also stuff you can find online, young people, because you love living online, and there's more conversations now about biracial identity development and what he said. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Yes, right here, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Sylvie, and I go to Bard High School Early College with the students. Um, Thank you so much for your talk, it was amazing. Um, in our political state today, I feel like liberals are leaning so far to the left to fight prejudice, but they're using radicalization in a way that I feel like it's not actually helping even the playing field. Do you believe that it is helping fight prejudice? Because in the end, because there's such a large gap in our country between like, su like superiority and inferiority, do you need to fight it with like, going so far to the left or do you think it ends up oversimplifying the problem? It's funny hearing you say prejudice. It, it, it sounds like when I was a kid, that word has been replaced by racism. But yes, prejudice, as I was introduced to it, is decreasing vastly. And the only reason it might not seem like it is if you don't happen to have lived long enough to remember the recent past. I think I'm 54, which is an age where it's now at the point where when I was a kid was a different time. Prejudice has vastly decreased in this society, but it's still there. And if you're just living within this slice, you're going to look at 
what is there. But there is a problem with the idea that on the political spectrum, from you guys' perspective, this is normal. So here's the center. Here is, you know, right-wing, crazy, whatever. And then there's liberal. But then on race, this is normal. You get rid of the test, for example, as opposed to teach everybody to do the test. There's the idea that only this creates change. And it's just not, it's not true. This has created a whole lot more change than this. It's just that this is more charismatic. And so it attracts people. This helps people. But if the right's all going to one side, do you think it's necessary to have the left Say that again. Well, because the right, the, I feel like the left is just battling the right, and because the left is getting so radicalized, and while the right's getting so radicalized, they're just losing ground. Yes. And then I feel like both of them are just creating more destruction instead of helping find a solution, which is totally more bipartisan. What you said. <laughs> I, I, I have a slightly different answer. She's talking about right and left and them canceling each other out and both being destructive. And I, I want to just, that's what she said. I just want to say, or just in the change the story place. Sometimes we are hyperbolic. Sometimes we have hyperbolic rhetoric on purpose. And sometimes something is so egregious that it raises up a movement that can feel like it's crazy left. I think we've been in that space a little bit, right? When you're in a space where the Obama gets elected and like, woohoo, we're post-racial and we're not. John's right, it's always been there. But it did, it did I think, come out in that equal opposite reaction, that people took, put, they didn't have to put their hoods back on. They're like, honey, we can just carry some torches and do this thing in public. So there's been such a horrific overreaction to the changes that are absolutely true and real that I think that's why the left feels radical. And I just don't want you guys to think that the left, the radical left, is actually not lynching people. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid we have to stop. Will you join me in thanking our speakers? Yes. So, really, thank you, John and Jackie and Bob. We're going to just take a five minute break. If anyone needs to use the restroom, we have to eat and then come back, and the next panel is going to start at 12.05. Uh, so, thank you very much.